Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video. This week's video is about a case that I first heard on a podcast probably about a year or so ago but I lost the name of the podcast and forgot the name of the case and it's been driving me insane for the longest time. I cannot tell you how long I've spent on Google trying to find this story again. Something about it just really stuck with me and a couple of months ago I finally found it again which is shocking because it's actually a really well covered case. Today I'm going to share with you the heartbreaking story of the Annecy shootings, or sometimes known as the French Alps killing. And I just want to put a small disclaimer at the beginning of this video as well. The online information about this case seems to be a little bit patchy. I've had to piece some bits together, a lot of the sources contradict each other, which often happens when a case is so well covered, there's so many different news outlets talking about things, and they begin to contradict each other eventually. I've done my best to create a solid timeline here, but my storytelling may be a tad patchy, as the sources are, but I'd rather that than spread any false information. Our story begins with the Al Hilly family, an Iraqi British family who lived in Claygate in Surrey. The family consisted of 50 year old Iraqi born Saad Al Hilly, his wife, 47 year old Iqbal, her 74 year old mother, Sahila Al Alaf, and the couple's children, seven year old Zainab and four year old Zina. When everything went down, the family were in France on a camping holiday in the French Alps. They'd stayed at a campground on the shore of Lake Annecy and had plans to stay there until the end of the week. It was the morning of the 5th of September 2012. Iqbal, Zainab and Zina spotted happily picking apples near the campsite. No worries whatsoever. Around 1pm, the family get into their maroon BMW and drive to a tiny community called Cheveline. The family drive through Cheveline up a long, steep road called Le Combe de Ire, eventually reaching a dead end, which is just a small public car park. The Combe de Ire is a long, thin road. It goes on for about three kilometres, and once you're on it, you can't really turn around. I mean, they're in the French Alps, the roads are very thin and windy, so it's likely that Saad may have taken a wrong turning and ended up on this road, and had no choice but to just carry on driving until he reached a point where he could turn around, the car park at the end. Also, this case did take place in France, meaning there's going to be a lot of French words and French pronunciation, and we know from past videos that my French pronunciation leaves a lot to be desired, so please excuse that. Although we'll never know for sure what the family's movements were at this point once they got to the car park at the end of the Comte d'Ear, Zainab has told investigators that her and her father were outside the car when everything began. Maybe they just wanted to take a breather or maybe they wanted to take in the scenery. They're in the mountains, it's beautiful. It's thought that they had a brief chat with the cyclist who was also there. This would have been 45 year old French cyclist, Sylvain Moliere. And then the gunshots begin. When they hear the gunshots, Saad probably automatically moves quickly back towards the car. And he's likely to have already been shot at least once by the time he reaches his car. He probably shouts at Zainab to get back in, but she stood there frozen. Or maybe she got injured in the time it took them to get back to the car. Saad jumps into the car and puts it in reverse, pulling the car around in a 180 degree arc in an attempt to speed back down the road, which is illustrated by the tire marks on the ground. When he pulled into the car park, he probably put the car with the nose facing towards the tree line. When he jumps back into the car, he sort of reverses it back round so he can then go straight back down the road. But as he's doing so, as he's reversing, it's possible that he maybe hit Sylvain with the car and dragged him back through the dirt. Or it's also possible that the killer later moved Sylvain's body to lay next to the car. What we know is that when the car was later found, Sylvain was lying right next to it. But as quickly as Saad moved, it's now too late. The shooter is now out in the open, firing directly at the car, and Saad has managed to get the car's back wheels stuck in the dirt bank at the side of the car park. The scene would be discovered only minutes later. An ex-RAF pilot called Brett Martin had been cycling up the same road in Cheveline and actually been overtaken just a few minutes earlier by Silva. It's not long until Brett arrives at the scene, at which point the damage has already been done. He was a mere few minutes away, but he never heard any gunshots. The car's engine is still running when he arrives and Saad, Iqbal and Sahela have all been shot in the head twice, other bullets barely missing them. Saad was slumped over the steering wheel with Iqbal and Sahela both in the back seat. Sylvan had been shot five times, twice in the head. Zainab had been shot once in the shoulder and then hit around the head with a barrel of a gun. She was lying outside the car, still alive but barely, and Brett immediately puts her into the recovery position, likely saving her life. 
He checks for Sylvan's pulse and turns off the car's engine before calling the emergency services. Now he doesn't have signal where they are quite high up in the mountain, so he has to cycle further down the hill in order to make the call, which came in at 3.48 p.m. At 4.20 p.m. the gendarme, the French police and medical professionals arrive at the scene. Zainab is immediately rushed to hospital in nearby Grenoble and everyone's very careful not to disturb this crime scene as they cordon off the road and wait for forensic experts to travel in from Paris which is hours away. When the forensic team arrived they carefully photographed and studied the crime scene being careful not to disturb any of the bodies as per protocol. In fact they were so careful that they didn't realise that the family actually had had two children. Not until later that night when the police spoke to people back at the campsite was it mentioned that there were actually two daughters. And from that point the entire team's number one priority becomes to find four-year-old Xena. Helicopters and search dogs scramble but it's not until midnight, nearly eight hours after the attack, do they find her. She'd been hiding beneath her mother's skirt in the car the entire time, hidden away in the folds of the fabric. She didn't know if the police were good guys or bad guys, so she just stayed under her mother's skirt, safe and physically unharmed, though I can't say psychologically. Imagine that, a four-year-old girl hiding beneath her mother's corpse for eight hours. The crime immediately struck the authorities as strange. Annecy was a very quiet area. Violent, brutal crimes were just not something that happened often around here, which made this crime stand out even more. In a standard year, there was only ever one, maybe two murders, and they're pretty typical murders at that, domestic or robberies. The mass murder on the mountain was brutal, psychotic. Whoever did this tried to murder children. And this wouldn't prove to be an easy investigation for anyone involved. It happened in France, but the family were British. The French police thought they could only be solved at home in England, and the British police thought there was the duty of the French police to solve it. So in order to speed up the investigation, the countries agreed to create a joint Franco-British investigation under Eurojust, an agency of the European Union that helps deal with judicial issues between EU countries. So the Surrey police joined forces with the French investigators to help solve the case. One of the first things established about this was that only one weapon was used to kill all four people. So this was likely only the work of one person. It doesn't take long for theories and rumours to begin to fly. At first it just seemed to be the work of a madman, someone who had a mental break went up into the mountains with the intent to kill. It didn't matter who it was. But French detectives soon start to play with the theory that the murders could have been the work of a professional hit. Saad Hilly was the target, according to the French police. His family and Sylvain were unfortunate bystanders. And Saad, like I said, was the main focus of this theory. He'd left Iraq in the 70s with his parents and they moved to London. Eventually, they moved again to Claygate in Surrey in 1984. Him and Iqbal were going to meet in Dubai in the early 2000s and she was also Iraqi born but had reportedly been brought up in Sweden where she trained as a dentist. She practiced in Dubai before meeting Saad in what was described as a great love affair which culminated in her moving to the UK to be with him and they married after just three months. The family had been described as great neighbours, great friends, always welcoming and the kind of people who would help out with anything. But most of the rumours revolved around Saad's job. He trained as an engineer and started his own small aeronautics design business in 2001, which he ran from home. His firm was successful and he worked on some pretty big projects, including with the aircraft manufacturer Airbus. He was also the director of a company based in Swindon that offered business services, aerial photographers and survey services. And as well as all this, he also worked for Guildford-based Surrey Satellite Technology as a contract mechanical design engineer and he'd been there for about a year and a half when he died reportedly working on a secret contract linked to European aeronautic defence and space. After the murder, rumours became rampant that Saad was under surveillance from the government due to his work and he was known to security services, which is a rumour I'm sure was probably fuelled by a touch of racism. But these rumours were dismissed as inaccurate. The government weren't surveilling Saad at all. His colleagues at Surrey Satellite Technology said that his work with European Aeronautics was completely routine and that he wasn't required to sign any secrets act. He wasn't keeping any big secrets. 
But the papers ran with the fact that Saad was working on top secret projects, that he was working on classified projects for the government, all kinds of stuff like that. Some said that he was a spy and was sharing classified information with Iraq. But the fact is that Saad was just a freelance mechanical and aeronautic engineer. He was a very smart guy, a very educated guy. He wasn't a spy, he wasn't sharing secrets or top secret work as far as the public are aware anyway. But similar rumours also began to fly around Silva Moliere and his job though. Now he worked as a welder at a metal factory which produced components for the nuclear industry, owned by a nuclear company called Areva. People began to speculate that Silvan had been working on a classified project and that he'd stumbled across a big secret by accident and needed to be silenced. The fact of the matter is though that he was just a welder, he knew no secrets. He's been described as a very straightforward, quiet man who lived in a small alpine town called Eugene all of his life. He had no enemies, he had three children, the youngest of which was just nine months old, and he was your standard family man. And it soon became very clear to the French police apparently that if they wanted to find answers in this case, they needed to be looking at the Alhilles, not at Sylvain. The French police said that he just seemed to be an innocent bystander in all of this, although if the killer did go out of their way to move Sylvain's body, then that does raise some extra questions. It's also been suggested that Sylvain was shot first before any of the Ahilis, and then the killer turned his gun back on Sylvain after he was finished, shooting him a couple more times. He was hit with five separate bullets. Initial reports seem to point strongly towards the murder being a professional hit. Saad, Iqbal, Sahela and Sylvain were all killed with what is known as a double tap two bullets straight into the head each, reportedly a classic trait of a hit. The deaths were very clean, very straightforward, whoever did this was aiming for the head, they had purpose. Zainab was shot once in the shoulder and was beaten over the head with the barrel of the gun. Depending on which source you read, she was either hit once over the head or violently beaten many times. If this was a hitman, somebody perhaps with a code of conduct and not to kill children, it would make sense if Zainab would not be shot in the head and would perhaps just be hit once over the head with the gun so she'd lose consciousness and the hitman could get away. Maybe. But if she was violently hit with a barrel multiple times, that suggests that it was more of a random, psychotic, violent attack. But the gun used was unusual to say the least. It was a Luger Luger P08, a gun from the First World War, which generally wouldn't be the first choice of a professional assassin. It was a standard issue to the Swiss army during both world wars, which is interesting as the murder site was only 40 miles from the border of Switzerland, and the gun fires highly distinctive 7.655 millimeter caliber bullets, and it only has capacity for eight rounds. In total, the police said there were about 25 bullets fired at the scene, meaning that the murderer would have had to have paused to reload at least twice. The bullets used in such a gun are now fairly rare non-standard ammunition, and are generally all marked with their date of manufacture. And now this is a fact that I assume it did lead to a dead end in the investigation, as I couldn't find any follow-up information about that. It's thought that many of the gunshots were fired at close range, about three foot away from the victims, and many bullet casings littered the ground at the scene, which would once again be very unusual for a trained assassin, who would generally leave the scene spotless. If these murders were potentially linked to the work of Saad or Sylvain, the hit definitely wasn't a professional one. On the 10th of September 2012, just a few days after the murders took place, the bomb squad are called in to the Al Hilly home in Claygate, Surrey. Now it was routine for the police to search the Al Hilly's house in the aftermath, see if they could find anything interesting pertaining to the investigation, but soon after they entered the house, it was reported that officers had found a potentially explosive substance. Two whole streets were evacuated, cordons were put up, and a bomb disposal unit was called out to the scene to carry out an assessment, but nothing suspicious was found. The Ahilis did not have a bomb in their home, shockingly. However, the search did turn up a taser, which was actually illegal for the general public to possess in the UK, so this did raise some questions. The next big piece of information to come out about this case was in October, when it was confirmed that Saad had visited a bank in Geneva, Switzerland shortly before his death and it was originally believed that this trip may have had something to do with the murders. The bank account was under Saad's name and is believed to have contained around £750,000. Saad's father, Kadim Al-Hili, had died a year before and had left a significant inheritance, along with a £1 million home in Claygate and a studio in Spain. 
and this inheritance caused Saad to have a significant falling out with his brother, Zaid. Saad lived in the £1 million home in Claygate with his family, and Zaid had moved in after the tragic death of his wife. According to Zaid, Saad wanted him to sign over his half of the house, but he didn't want to. This culminated in a huge row, and Zaid moved out. And when the family died, they hadn't spoken in almost a year as they were bickering over who should get the inheritance. They communicated solely through solicitors and letters from their lawyers. Zaid was considered a person of interest in this case pretty early on, with the police asking him to confirm his whereabouts in the days before the murder and took his mobile and laptop to investigate. He denied having anything to do with his brother's death. In fact, he denied any feud at all at first. It was just a little row. They weren't homicidal. And it seems like the police agreed with this at first until June 2013 when 54 year old Zaid Al Hili is arrested on suspicion of conspiracy to commit murder. Panorama found that he'd reportedly tried to create a false will for his father in an attempt to withdraw two million pounds from his father's bank account in Switzerland, which is very dodgy behavior. But ultimately he was released from police bail in January, 2014, with the police saying, at this stage there is insufficient evidence to charge him with any criminal offense and no further police action has been taken at this time. And no further action has been taken in the six years since. So I think we can be pretty sure the police have very little evidence that Zaid had anything to do with the murders. In the same Panorama episode that I just mentioned, it was also reported that a grey BMW right-hand drive 4x4 car was seen at the crime scene at the time of the murders, or very close to the time of the murders, seen by just one witness, a forestry worker. The police have followed up on this lead, saying there's a possibility that the driver may have been an accomplice to the killer but this vehicle has never been found and they can't be sure that the information is even correct when they only have one witness to back it up. But there were also reports of a motorcycle. The rider had a goatee and an unusual helmet. And this sighting did actually lead to an arrest of a former police officer who had been sacked from the police just a year earlier for misconduct. He lived in a village very close to where the murders had taken place and this officer was said to have been a gun enthusiast and the police are said to have removed several guns from his home, including one very similar to the weapon used in the attack. He was also said to be a trained marksman and an enthusiastic hunter who knows the mountains inside out. Now this police officer is questioned, but it doesn't seem as if this lead went anywhere. Over the next couple of years, more suspects were identified, including a former soldier who had recently committed suicide in the region and a Belgian man who had been involved in a similar crime. But there's insufficient evidence for an arrest in any of these cases. Now the family were Iraqi and the British and French media immediately begin speculating links to Saddam Hussein, because every Iraqi person must have links to Saddam Hussein, right? Both the British and the French begin to believe that the answers to their case would lie in Iraq. They begin focusing in on the families, particularly Saad's background in their home country. It's reported that Saad and the family had to leave the country when he was a teenager in the 70s due to his father having a falling out with the Ba'ath Party, Saddam Hussein's political party. A lot of people in the wider Ahili family held high positions in Iraq's monarchical regime, which the Ba'ath Party very much opposed. Kadim al-Hili decided to flee when one of his uncles was tortured by the regime, so bad that he was left with brain damage. Saad and his family had to leave Iraq because they didn't agree with Saddam Hussein and his policies, but this didn't stop the media speculating. A lot of links were made between the al-Hili's bank account in Geneva and the fact that Saddam Hussein also had a bank account in Geneva with about £800,000 in. Speculation began to fly that the al-Hili's were laundering money for Saddam Hussein, although it's worth saying that Hussein had actually been dead for almost six years by this point, and the family had to flee because they opposed Hussein's regime and party. It's highly unlikely that they were working in conjunction with them, and Zaid has stressed how offensive it is that the media even suggests the possibility. Therefore, it's been suggested that this was an Iraqi hit on Saad because his family left the regime. But Saad was just an ordinary man. He was a little more than a child when his family left the country and there's nothing to point towards anyone important in Iraq having any issues with him. In my opinion, all of the articles I read which spoke about Saad and his links to Iraq and Saddam Hussein kind of read as if they were steeped in a little bit slash 
quite a bit of racism. It just sort of read that, oh, he's Iraqi, he has to know Saddam Hussein, and that just wasn't really the case. But let's move on and focus on Iqbal. I've already spoken about her past a little bit, but what I didn't mention is that Iqbal was actually already married before she met Saad. An apparent secret first husband in the United States called James, James Thompson, who she'd married for a green card so she could work as a dentist in the USA. It was a marriage of convenience and the two had a very platonic relationship, they even slept in separate bedrooms. Whilst in the USA, Iqbal went by the name Kelly. After two years, the pair divorced amicably and it seems like Iqbal moved to the United Arab Emirates where she would go on to meet Saad in Dubai and begin the next chapter of her life. But what does this have to do with the murders? Well, in a very strange twist of fate, James actually died on the same day that she did, in Mississippi, USA. Which of course makes some really great headlines, but it was later proven that he died of natural causes, a heart attack. He'd been having chest pains for some time, but refused to go to the doctors. And his family and friends have no doubt that this was a heart attack, just a huge coincidence that happened on the same day his ex-wife died. But investigators did play with the idea that maybe he'd been poisoned. I saw articles referring to a poison dart. Did James and Iqbal potentially have an enemy who wanted them both gone? Well, by this point, they'd been divorced for over 10 years. They had nothing to do with each other anymore, as far as I can find. So it's highly unlikely. As you've probably been able to tell throughout this video, this case is just rife with speculation. The last ever photo of the family was taken at 3.15 the day they died, all looking happy and carefree, smiling at the camera. This doesn't seem like a family who were running away from anything, who was scared that a hitman was coming after them. Whatever happened, it's clear that the family probably weren't expecting anything, they were just on their summer holiday, and then somebody committed the perfect crime. It seems this case died down around 2017. Most of the last big news articles that were found about it were all dated then. There hasn't been any big advances in this for a while, and it seems almost inevitable at this point that it's probably never going to get solved. The area that the Ahilis were driving in that day is famously quiet. People remembered seeing their car driving up the road, but saw no other cars following them. It wasn't planned for the family to go to the woods that day, they hadn't advertised their plans at all. It was actually Zainab's choice to go for a walk in the woods, and Saad reportedly asked a man at the campsite where they should go for a walk. And they end up in this small car park at the top of the Comte Ear, which is an area no local would particularly recommend for tourists, there's just not really anything there. It seems the family maybe just got a little bit lost and missed a turning somewhere, and if somebody was following them, they did a very good job at staying stealthy. It seems like the theory of this just being a lone psychopath could be the closest to the truth. Somebody alone in the woods maybe wanting to blow off some steam and go hunting. Somebody very, very angry at the world. And then this whole car of tourists pulls up in this car park. In anger, he just begins shooting, a lifetime of being around guns maybe giving him the skills to go straight for the heads. Or maybe this person was purposely waiting at the top of the road, just waiting for someone to kill. Maybe they intended to pull off the perfect crime all along. Somebody random with no links to the family whatsoever, no links to Sylvan, just wanting to kill someone. Investigators tend to agree nowadays that it's unlikely this was a professional hit, with the unusual gun and the casings left littered around the scene. No one was the target, the Alhilis and Sylvain Moliere were just people in the wrong place at the wrong time. Maybe this psychopath drew the line at killing children, or maybe he heard somebody, Brett, coming up the road, and didn't have time to finish off the job with Zeynep. It's likely that they never even saw Zena in the car, her mother immediately ushering her under her skirt when the gunshots began. Zeynep remained in a coma for quite a few days, but she came around eventually. She had very little memory of the attack, just that her and her father were outside the car together when the bullets began flying. On return to the UK, Zainab and Zena lived with a foster family whilst investigators looked into their safety, before eventually being placed with family members. It seems like these girls now live normal, happy lives with their maternal aunt in the UK. A small slither of happiness in an otherwise tragic case. The sisters still have each other. It seems the police are no closer to solving this now in 2020 than they were in September 2000. 2012. They've described it as the perfect crime. The fact that it probably was just sort of some lone psycho in the woods means that it's really, really hard to trace down. It could literally be anyone. But the very strange thing is 
this hasn't happened again. This doesn't seem to be a repeat offender, which is very interesting. I do wonder if the killer was somebody who was local to Chevaline, or was maybe somebody from somewhere else in the country travelled in with the pure intent to kill somebody. Maybe it's even somebody from Switzerland, which like I said was just 40 miles away. This being somebody from Switzerland as well also matches with the gun being a Swiss gun, or at least a gun used often in the Swiss army. There are so many different questions you can ask about this case and no question leads you any closer to the truth here. Let me know in the comments down below if you have any other theories about this case. Do you think it was a professional hit? Do you think it was a lone psycho? Do you think the person had an intent to kill? Why did he not kill the girls? I want to hear all of your thoughts down below. Also let me know if there's any other cases that you would like me to cover. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.